So if you were here last week, John did a sermon on kind of an obscure Old Testament passage that we don't often read, and he didn't know this, but I was also planning on doing a different obscure Old Testament passage. So we've been joking all week. We're not actually in a sermon series, but we've been joking all week that we've made up a random obscure Old Testament passage series that we get to be in for two years. <laughs> so if you have a Bible or you can reach one, um, turn with me to Genesis 16. We'll start right at verse 1. Genesis 16. This is about Sarah and Abraham before they were called Sarah and Ab or, yeah, Sarah and Abraham. So they're still Sarai and Abram. But it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go and sleep with my slave, and perhaps we can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan for ten years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows that she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think is best. So Sarai mistreated Hagar. And so Hagar fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that was beside the road to Shur, wherever that is. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that will be, they will be too numerous to count. The angel said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. That's actually what it says. A wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all of his brothers. So Hagar gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for this interesting story about your people. And we ask that you teach us from it, teach us a little bit more about what it means to be your child and to have you as our God. In your name we pray. Amen. So, first of all, by a show of hands, how many have seen the movie Avatar? Okay, lots of you. So I might lose a, free, a few friends today. <laughs> I did not like the movie Avatar. <laughs> I'm sorry if it's, a, if it's someone's favorite movie. I just wasn't a fan. But I remember there was, well, there were a lot of things that kind of blew people's minds about this movie. But there was one scene in particular where there's um, a woman from the Navi, this native people from another planet, who falls in love with a man, and instead of saying, I love you, they say, I see you. And if you look online, you can find all kinds of philosophical arguments and theological arguments about what that meant, and translations from other words in other, in other languages, and all kinds of things. But what a lot of people thought it meant was it was kind of taking I love you to the next level. Instead of saying I love you and kind of meaning this emotional, warm, fuzzy feeling I get from you, they said, I see you, and it, it meant to, you know, to see someone in a relationship is to be valued and to have dignity, to really see what that person can bring to the table and who they are and to love them for that. So when, when the Navi woman said, I see you, to this man in Avatar, a lot of people got really excited and wanted to say that. I was in seminary when this movie came out, and there were lots of people dating, and they wanted to say, I see you, instead of I love you, and it was, it was a big thing. But, but it meant a lot to a lot of people. And it's not just an avatar where I've heard this phrase used in relationships with each other. It's so important to us to be seen in a relationship. So you can judge me on my, my taste in movies all you want, but one movie I do like is Runaway Bride, <laughs> which is one of those cheesy 90s romantic comedies with Julia Roberts and Richard Gere. <laughs> 
In this particular movie, Richard Gere has an ex-wife who he's really good friends with. She's a big part of his life. Um, it's one of those situations where it seems like the relationship is better after the divorce. And there's a scene in the movie where Richard Gere is playing piano, as he always does in his 90s romantic comedies. And his, wife, his ex-wife is sitting next to him. They're kind of having a moment, and at one point he looks at her and he says, what happened to us? Did I just not see you? And she said, yeah, that's it. You didn't see me. Being seen in this relationship was so important that their marriage disintegrated when she didn't feel seen. There was another show I was watching one night. I can't remember quite what it was. I think it was Parenthood. Um, but there was a married couple who were in kind of a rough patch in their marriage, and they went to see a counselor. And what they discovered was any time one or the other would give a suggestion or ask for something to change, then the person would respond and with a lot of defensiveness and anger and get kind of all up in arms instead of actually hearing what the person's trying to say. Which sounds very human. <laughs> And what the counselor had them do was, next time your husband or your wife makes a suggestion, before you respond, say, I hear you and I see you. Because this being seen thing was so important. This couple, I remember in the show, took it a little far and there was one scene where the wife asked the husband to pass the cereal and he said, I see you and I hear you. And then he passed the cereal. <laughs> so it may be a little overboard, but <laughs> the point was still the same. It's so important for us just to be seen in our relationships. All of these movies and shows had to do with marriages or romantic relationships, but it's important to be seen in our friendships too, isn't it? In our working relationships, we want to be really seen by our bosses and our coworkers or our employees. We want to be seen by our parents or by our children, by our friends. In all of our relationships, it's so important for us to be seen. Because when we're seen, we're given value and we're recognized for who we are and what we bring to the table. We just want to be seen. So in our story this morning, we have Hagar, who even now is kind of one of these invisible characters in the Old Testament. We don't often see Hagar in the story. We see Abraham and Sarah, right? She's, she's part of this much more famous storyline of Abraham and Sarah. Just before the passage we read, Abraham and Sarah were told they would have a child. Um, and if you know your Old Testament stories, you know they didn't believe her because they were really old. The Bible says 90 to 100. Um, <laughs> they were well, well past childbearing years. And so they didn't believe God's promise of a son. And so Sarah and Abraham took matters in their own hands and they got Sarah's slave, Hagar, who was apparently younger and able to have children. And Sarah said to Abraham, here, take my servant. Maybe that's what God meant when he said he'd give us a son. Maybe through our slave, that's how God will keep his promise. So Abraham did and Hagar got pregnant and she was going to bear him a son. Now it all sounds pretty scandalous to us, doesn't it? I know if Jeremy and I had had a hard time getting pregnant, clearly we didn't, but <laughs> if we had had a hard time, my suggestion to Jeremy would never have been, go ahead and find someone else and it will be fine. <laughs> that would not be okay. <laughs> but in this time, Hagar had the double whammy of being a woman and a slave, which really meant she was nothing to Abraham and Sarah but a piece of property. She had no choice in this matter, no dignity. She was completely invisible. Hagar was not seen. She just had to do what she was told. So the situation might have been normal in this time and place, but I can't imagine it was a whole lot of fun for Hagar. Can you? She had no choice whether she wanted to have a baby or who this father of her baby would be. It was just part of her job description all of a sudden. She just had to do as she was told. And so she did, and she was faithful, and she, she followed through on her job description. But then she began to resent it. And scripture says she despised Sarah because of the situation she'd be put in. And I have to say, I can't say that I blame Hagar a whole lot for <clears throat> despising 
Sarah and Abraham. But then Sarah seems to kind of get wind of this resentment, and Sarah begins to resent Hagar for resenting her, and it becomes this cycle of resentment. So she, Sarah goes to Abraham and says, this is your fault. You did this to us. <laughs> I might say that too. <laughs> And Abraham goes, no, no, this is your slave. You're in charge. You do what you need to do. And so what does Sarah decide to do? She mistreats Hagar. And the Bible doesn't tell us what that means. Maybe, she, maybe Hagar was beaten or refused food, or maybe it was more verbally or just ignoring her. We don't know what it was. But whatever happened between Hagar and Sarah, it was bad enough that it made Hagar run away. Hagar was invisible. She was just seen as property. She was made to just follow directions. She was given a new job description as an unwilling surrogate to her bosses. And so she ran. You can imagine, she was alone, maybe hurt, probably scared. She was pregnant with this baby that she maybe didn't even want anything to do with. And so she just took off into the desert. She ran. She wasn't given any dignity, any choice, any value. She wasn't being seen. So she left. But then a miracle happened. While Hagar was running, while she was in the desert near a spring of water, an angel came to her and said, Hagar, return and submit because that's when you'll feel God's grace. Return and submit because that's when you'll see God's blessing in this situation. And the angel tells Hagar that she'll have a son and he will be blessed and he may not be the son that was promised to Abraham first, but he'll also be a nation just like this promised son will be. And of course this wouldn't be without difficulty. The Bible describes Ishmael would be his name. He describes Ishmael as a wild donkey of a man. I think that's my new favorite phrase, wild donkey of a man. (laughs) And it says he'll get in fights and there will be disputes between Ishmael and his brothers, but he would still be blessed. In other words, he will be very human, (laughs) but he will still be blessed. And Hagar will be blessed for her faithfulness. All she has to do is return and submit. God saw her when she was maybe at her most invisible and said, come back to me so I can show you my grace. And I love Hagar's response. I think this is one of the most beautiful little verses in the Bible. She doesn't fight back. She doesn't disbelieve. She doesn't keep running. She simply says in faith, you are the God who sees me. When she was at her most helpless, her most scared, her most invisible, she says, you are the God who sees me. God saw her and gave her value, gave her grace, gave her life again. This thing that even still is so important to us in our relationships, in our friendships, in our marriages, in our working relationships. God saw Hagar. And God sees us here at Harbor Church today. God is the God who sees you. Now for some of us, this might be kind of a creepy thing to think about. <laughs> some, it made me, for a second, it made me think of the song, Santa Claus is coming to town, right? He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good, so be good, for goodness sake. That's kind of a creepy song to me. But (laughs) it can be kind of intimidating to think about the God of the universe seeing us and knowing us intimately, knowing every part of us. Sometimes it's easy for us to think of God as some kind of divine principle, just waiting to give us detention, just waiting for us to screw up. But the story of Hagar shows us that's not who God is. God is the God who sees us. 
He doesn't send us into fear mode looking for our worst. He sees us and knows us, every part of us, and he loves us deeply. No matter what we're struggling with, no matter what mistakes we've made, no matter what season of life we're in, God is the God who sees you. God knows everything about who we are, and he loves us because of and in spite of who we are. God sees you. Some of us this week had incredibly difficult weeks. Some of us had really great weeks. Some of us maybe had a mixture of both. <laughs> but what the story of Hagar shows us is that no matter what season of life we're in, no matter what we're ha what's happening around us or happening inside us, God is the God who sees you. Even in your darkest moments, when you feel most invisible, most helpless, when you just want to run like Hagar ran, God is the God who sees you. He sees us and he knows us and loves us so deeply that he sent his one and only son to live and to die and to rise again on our behalf. God is the God who sees you. But what's more, God sees us and says, come back to me. Come back to me, return and submit, because that's when you'll see God's grace in your life. Even when we want to run and we feel helpless like Hagar, God says to us, like he said to Hagar, come back so I can bless you. That's when we know the value and the dignity and the importance we have in the eyes of God when he sees us and when we return to him. God is the God who sees you. Now often here at Harbor Church, we'll give some kind of homework assignments or some kind of suggestion of how you can apply this to your life and I'm not gonna do that today. <laughs> Instead, I invite you, I invite each and every one of us this week to rest in the knowledge that God sees you. Even if you feel like no one else does, or no one else wants to, God sees you, and he loves you. Amen? Amen. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for these words of hope from your servant Hagar, that you are the God who sees us. And God, we know that you love us deeply, and you, you're watching over us in all times and all places, and we thank you for that, Lord. Teach us more about who you are and transform us more into who you would have us be as your children. Help us to return and submit when we need to so that we can receive your grace. In your name we pray, amen.